Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine in Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Zev Siegel, who is up in Seattle. How are you doing, Zev? I'm doing fine. I'm fully powered by espresso right now. Yeah, and, uh, and and absolutely. And why wouldn't you be? Zev is the co-founder of the Starbucks Coffee Company. You may have uh, heard of them. You may have seen them. You may even have drank there. And I'd say there's probably very few people in the world who haven't at this stage. Also founder of Quartermain Coffee Roasters, founder of socialbees.com, and obviously a, an international and much sought after keynote speaker. Um, so Zev, what I wanted to talk about today is I've certainly got the impression that maybe pre-pandemic because people were starting because it was more virtual work going on and people were starting to think okay yeah maybe I could go out on my own and I could you know set up my own venture or business I think after the pandemic a lot of people who maybe suffered or saw other people suffer through that pandemic maybe are starting to think okay maybe now is the time for me to look at what I want to do with the rest of my life and maybe that is to to start a new venture of, of your own. So having somebody who's who started, I would say one of the most successful ventures um, ever, um, what do you think about when somebody starts to think about moving into branching out on their own, starting something, whether on their own with other people, wh what are some of the considerations? What are some of the questions they should ask themselves? Well, I talk to people at, uh, several times a week who are starting companies, and I'm uh, completely up to date on what's going on. And I can tell you, yes, you are correct. There are a lot of people interested in not going back to work for someone else, but in starting their own company. And it's been a lot of fun talking to a bunch of them. Uh, well, the, the first thing that they need to think about is, are they in the right industry? Can they make a profit? Mm -hmm. You know, the founders of Starbucks uh, started looking at uh, coffee, what, in 1970, in the, the fall of 1970. And um, we quickly found out that, yep, that was a good industry to be in. You can make a profit and you can do it. You can earn a living or make a profit at several different levels of the industry, not just selling drinks, but roasting coffee, wholesaling coffee, etc. And uh, so pass the sniff test another yeah. that you know another thing that i see that people really need to think about john is uh, do they have the ability to manage the finances of the startup and then the operations of the company this is a big deal because so many people have great ideas but they don't have the financial management skills and where the rubber hits the road on this one is if the prospective investors figure out that the entrepreneur doesn't even have a CFO or even an accountant, they're not going to invest. Right. You know, so I always tell them, make sure you've got a financial person on tap. They don't have yeah. to be an employee, by the way, and they don't have to be a partner. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, then beyond that, what's in it for the customer? Um, this is something that happens a lot with uh, digital entrepreneurs, where they get all revved up about uh, a, a new platform that they can put together or a, a piece of software that's gonna save money in a particular industry, like say solar power installers are gonna just freak out over this. They're gonna love mm -hmm. it. But that doesn't mean that they're going to buy it. Yep. And so the, the, this connection to the customer uh, needs to be addressed. And the way people, well, for instance, in tech, in the tech field is they come up with um, a dummy cell phone app that ju just as the images and show that to people. Or if they have a little money, they can do the MVP, the minimum mm -hmm. viable product, which kind of looks and functions like an app, but isn't really an app. It's just, uh, there's nothing in the back. Um, and they can show that to people and they can begin to sense uh, through basically informal focus groups, um, whether they're onto something or sure. not. <laughs> So, so one thing, and um, um, just coming back to the start there, what you just said about the financial part, because I do think this is incredibly important because I often think that even people who've been in business for a while, you know, they've had jobs, maybe they haven't run a business, but they've, uh, they work for companies, there is an amount of finance uh, where they understand finance, maybe on a superficial level at the end, it's surprisingly how few people really understand you know, things like cash flow and run rate and all of that. And, and that's the kind of stuff that can really unravel pretty quickly. 
Well, not only can it unravel pretty quickly, but uh, it keeps the business from starting. Uh, you know, it's one thing to say to, suppose the entrepreneurs thinking about getting involved in an incubator that's going to help them develop mm -hmm. their idea and their business plan, et cetera. Uh, well, they go to the incubator and they tell them, well, I don't know anything about finance. You know, I wish I did. The incubator says, that's why we're here. We're going to help you with that. If you say that to a, an angel investor, they're going to reach for the door handle and try yeah. and get out of the room. I mean, because they don't want to do business with you if you don't know how to manage money. So it's not a, it's not a sin at all to not understand how to manage money or how business flows, how money flows through a business or the difference between a PL and a cash flow. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to know those at the very first moment, but you can learn them. And if you have trouble with that part of your brain, you can get a partner or an advisor who can help you. Yeah, yeah. And, and nowadays, as you said, I mean, nowadays, it's very easy to find those kind of experts and fractional, you know, variable resource, get them. Yep. Um, you can get them anywhere right now. The, the, uh, and, the, and the second part uh, that you're referring to there is about really understanding does your does your product or service have some legs? And I think this is like something or, or will it this is something I feel probably people shortcut a little bit um, or maybe they don't go wide enough with their with their testing. Maybe they test it out on a certain amount of people or a certain group, but maybe they don't go far enough on that testing part. Yeah, that happens a lot. And um, especially, I think, with products, uh, tangible products and retail. You remember retail? We used to. There used yeah, to be retail. Sure, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, stores where you walk in a door. Uh, and uh, yeah, when, when it's a tangible product, that, that happens uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, I've worked with a company that developed um, a, a new piece of equipment, and uh, it's for a particular industry. And man, they, they had some interesting problems trying to convince people that it would uh, make a difference. They had to build prototypes, hand-built prototypes, in order mm. to put it in people's hands and get them to say, yeah, this is good. We're going to salute your flag. We love this. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and Go on, sorry. In, uh, I, going back to the financial stuff, uh, you know, Starbucks was founded by three young guys. We were 26, 27 years old. And uh, this was 50 years ago. Fortunately for the three of us, one of us, a man named Jerry Baldwin, turned out to be a pretty good financial person. He still <laughs> is. And I don't know what would have happened to the other two of us, that's myself and Gordon Bowker, if Jerry hadn't developed into a really good financial executive, uh, no, that's a, that, that, that's a really uh, that's a really good story for people because it just shows you that, especially if you're starting with other people, that maybe it is good to look for what are the what are the core strengths that other people, maybe some surprising ones that they have, so you're not all kind of focused in the same place, and uh, and at least one of you is uh, is focused on on the financial side. And with um, the, two, the first two hires that we made. Um, we're fabulous people. We, we, we all, the three of us knew we needed to hire people who had abilities that we didn't have. And so the first two people are hired were geniuses. I mean, they went on to really long careers in the industry. Um, and we learned from them. And there's some, some entrepreneurs have a little bit of a, a weak ego problem. They don't want to hire people that are better than they are at anything. Yeah. And that's, boy, is that a mistake? <laughs> well, well, yeah, no, obviously, I mean, it's a ma it's a massive mistake, and I do think that's something that does afflict some entrepreneurs, and then they end up uh, stretching themselves too thin. But it becomes that control factor, as opposed to you. You just framed it very differently there for people. It's like you bring on people with these other skill sets, and you learn from them. You want to hire people that you can learn from, as opposed to going, well, I'll grudgingly hire somebody, but I bet you they won't do this as well as I do it. Yeah, it's I see that all the time, but. Not everyone, you know, it depends mm -hmm. on the person. And lots of people would agree with the co-founders of Starbucks that, um, you know, yeah, you, you hire the uh, people who are really good at their job. Not, mm, not overqualified necessarily, but right. better, they can do their job better than you can. Yeah. So after you, after you like hired these people and you were in the early stages of, of, of Starbucks as a, you know, as a startup venture, what, what were some of the things that surprised you that maybe you weren't expecting? 
There are two things that come to mind immediately, John. Um, one is even though we had pretty good financial management, we didn't pay attention to something that really bit us on the rear later on. Um, in the second year, we ex I, I, the polite way to put it is we expanded beyond our capital base. Right. That's a nice way of saying we ran out of money. Mm -hmm. So how did we do that? Well, our first store was successful. It was profitable, you know, practically from the first week. Second store, successful, profitable. And then we opened a roasting plant. Um, that you know, nice, a nice operation. Well, the cost of the roasting plant bankrupted us. Right. But we were so excited, you know, we were we were doing what's called <laughs> go go for it. Just yeah. go for it. Yeah. Well, go for it's not a very good strategy. Uh, and we were rescued because our first two stores had been successful and we appeared to know what we were doing. There were some local guys who said, uh, we approached, they were customers of ours. Uh, and we approached them and said, hey, could you bail us out here? Would you like to buy some equity in our company? And they did. They were not sorry they did that later. Yeah, yeah I can imagine. Um, but, it, but it's a really interesting point that you just raised there is that, that success, right? Maybe you have initial success and obviously, uh, and the temptation is there to just, you know, go into a sprint. And maybe sometimes that's the right thing to do. But I guess sometimes you have to temper your enthusiasm about your initial success and make sure you don't do um, what you did and like overextend yourself uh, unless, you, unless you're pretty confident of getting bailed out. Yeah, John, there was a second surprise. You asked about surprises. Yeah. Uh, the second surprise was that um, I, I think it would um, come under the heading of, you better keep your eye on the ball. Uh, here's what happened. Uh, and I take the rap for this one. It was my, my doing. Um, we started, uh, we were, remember, we were only in Seattle and yep. only in the coffee business. So we said, oh, you know, those coffee grinders that we sell to consumers, uh, hand crank grinders and little electric grinders, let's start importing them directly. Let's go around the, the importer. Oh, I sure we did that. And um, now, you know, those commercial grinders that we have in our stores, the big things yep. like, look like R2-D2. Uh, yep. Okay, let's direct import those too. Hey, <laughs> and, and you know, the uh, supermarkets, supermarkets uh, aren't yet selling gourmet coffee. Let's beat everyone else to the punch. We'll go into supermarkets. That's coffee, right? It's the same thing mm -hmm. as we're doing, right? Wrong. Um, so what happened is we started uh, experimenting with these ancillary businesses, which sucked up some cash you know they, they weren't they weren't generating enough profit and eventually mostly thanks to my partners um we realized that we had to just we had a really good thing going with our core business of roasting and retailing and wholesaling coffee beans and we ought to focus on that and yeah. wow the company just became a lot more profitable when we started focusing yeah, that, that's a really, I think that's a really powerful point there, Zev, because I do see this happening a lot, not just to start up, but to establish companies. And I think we've probably all been guilty of it at times is where your core business is as enthusiastic and, and everything as you are about it. You do see shy, you do see these other opportunities and you think maybe we could do this, maybe we could do that. And suddenly everybody gets excited <laughs> and says, oh, yes, we could do and go into that. But you have to be, you have to start to be really disciplined about asking yourself, is this going to impact the focus on the core business? And is this the right time or should we ever be getting into it? But I think we have to be a little bit more, um, how should we say, we should uh, drill drill ourselves a little bit more before we sh run after these ancillary businesses. Oh, they're so tempting. And there's another little factor involved in this, which is that many of the people that are interested in starting companies, and I include myself, are a little bit ADHD. You know, they, they, they jump from one thing to another. And that's why it's so appealing not to work for a corporation because the corporation wants you to work on whatever your assignment is. So you have men and women who, whose minds are wandering all the time and you, you give them a, oh, it's almost like giving them a play store. You know, they have a little company that's being successful mm -hmm. and they get very tempted to start branching out into other areas instead of mining the central vein for all it's worth. 
Mm. Yeah. So how do you, when you advise, uh, when you advise uh, startups or, or small companies or growing companies, how do you advise them to keep the focus? Because I'm sure when you're talking to them, they start to come to you with other ideas all the time. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, I, I give the advice that other people gave me at one time, uh, which is, hey, you know, that that idea that you've got, that's a really good idea. So um, what's, what do you think it's going to cost to start that division? Oh, they hadn't thought about that. Uh, so we do a, what I call a startup budget. It's a separate mm -hmm. budget that, you know, what's going to cost? Okay, now, now let's look at what the first two years operation are going to look like, you know, 24 months, month by month. So uh, you're going to start up and you, you just start asking questions in a very positive way. I'm always positive, uh, but I'm positive, but I'm interested in the reality of the forecast. Right. So what do you think happens when somebody who's thinking of uh, starting a new part of their company sees when you, they look at the startup budget and then what turns out to be the operating loss for the first nine months? Oh my God, they can't believe it's going to cost that much money. And I, you know, and sometimes I have to feign surprise, um, you know, like, gee, that really is a lot of money. It looks like you're going to need about $170,000 to try that. And then of course they don't do it because <laughs> it's, it's not going to, it's not going to pan out. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's great about that too, though, is I, I, it is the fact that I, I think as going back to what we were talking about at the very beginning about the financial part is sometimes people just don't, you know, they look at a great idea. They think it's a great idea or whatever, but when you go through the financials, they don't realize the amount of money that's going to go in the cost that's going to be there. And that's even before the split focus comes in. Yeah, you know, John, if, probably amongst your very large audience, there are people who, like me, occasionally give advice to uh, people who are starting companies and focusing, all, excuse me, always coming back to the forecast, the gross profit, the net profit, the, all the, ad, the cost of the assets you need, the cost of the developers that you need to write the, the new program, all that stuff has to be quantified. And, and it, you'd be doing a favor to any startup entrepreneur to get them to look at those numbers. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree totally because, I mean, let's face it, we've been through these periods and we're, and we're still in kind of one of them with where, where some people just promote, oh, it's all just, just top line growth, just top line growth. Don't worry about anything else, all top line growth. And then, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it'll all sort itself out. But the reality is, as you say, is the people who are really successful are the people who pay attention to all of it. Yeah, I've been working with a woman who has a great little company. It's just two people. They import some stuff and mark it up and sell it in a really creative way on the web and on the internet. It's really fun. It's a great <laughs> little business. So because of the shipping problem that we're all experiencing, she had to air freight some stuff. And in the forecast that we were working on for this quarter, um, even though she was using air freight, she had held her gross profit as a constant that I said, wait a minute, if yeah. you're using air freight, your, your gross profit, excuse me, your, 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 yes, yes, your gross profit's going to go down because you're going to have to pay more for shipping. And there was a long silence at the end of the phone. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, drat uh, yeah you know <laughs> and of course she she made the adjustment but it made her it was a uh, a reality moment where she had to face the actual impact on her bottom line of that air freight yeah and that's what and that's what i, I love because i think uh, you know just just um modeling these things out quickly as you said or or adding the, the proper gross uh, or the proper cost factor in there so you get the proper gross margins it's little things like that. It's those attention to detail that really, I don't know if little things, but it's attention to detail that makes a difference. And I think to your point, I think naturally people who set up or run businesses or, or start up businesses, they're naturally enthusiastic. So they want to think optimistically and move forward. And you're just saying, yes, that's all well and good and don't lose that. But you also got to do the reality checks. There's another little thing that people who, who are listening to this um, might keep in mind if they're giving advice, which is you want to be a little careful about saying something's a bad idea <laughs> because <laughs> you might be wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, so it's never a bad idea. It's just, let's look at the numbers.
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a great. I think that's a that's a great point, and uh, it's a great psychological point as well. Yeah, because yeah, you don't want to be the one to say yeah that was a terrible idea, and they take it somewhere else, and it takes off. Yeah, it's not good for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, but what, what was one of the last uh, piece of advice you would give to to somebody um, who is thinking about you know making a step for the first time out into to a venture of their own? I would say that uh, right at the present moment is a great time to be thinking about a business that can be profitable. Uh, there are many reasons, but one of the things that's going on, and I see it almost every day, is entrepreneurs have more access to resources and particularly to angel investors than they've ever had because of Zoom, the acceptance of Zoom by just about everybody. You can contact a person through LinkedIn, talk them into having a 20 minute Zoom with you and bingo, it's done. Whereas, you know, before COVID, you'd have to set an appointment, go across town or maybe to another city and wait in the lobby and be dissed by his staff. And, you know, it, but now you just get right into his brain or her brain. And I just think that's fantastic. And it's really made a difference, this access to, uh, to resources and particularly to angel investors. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more with you. And having, uh, having been involved in a number of times, you know, traipsing up and down Sand Hill Road up in, you know, up in the, <laughs> the, the Bay Area with all the, the venture capitalists and everything, it's a little, it can be kind of a little soul destroying, to be honest, the whole process. Well, well there's another thing that uh, one entrepreneur pointed out to me, which is when you get online with, with somebody, you look, you look equal. Yeah. Each, of you, each of you occupies the same amount of real estate on the screen. Whereas if you went to their office, you would be on the other side of a large desk. Yes, no, you would be. And, and chances are, number one, they depends where, where you are in your process, but they probably aren't going to be on time. And yeah, you're probably going to come in rushed looking as if oh, another one. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and as soon as you start your PowerPoint, they'll take a phone call. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So no, I agree with you. I, I think this is I think this has been very good for access, as you said, to people, be able to meet people. And also just for just for now with um you know, with things like Upwork and other, I mean, you've got access to resources across the world where you can you can find experts and augment what you're doing. Yeah, so I I think it's a fantastic. It's a fantastic time. What would be your one word of a so that's that's a positive, like it's a great time, you got access, you could do that. What would be your one word of caution? Well, the, the caution, of course, is that if your uh, forecast or your team are weak in some way, don't think for a minute that angel investors won't find that. They'll, mm. they'll find it. They'll find it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and they'll point it out to you and they'll make you go home and work on it. And then maybe you can come back and talk to them another day. Yeah, so that's a great piece of advice there is like, yeah, make sure you have all your homework done. And if there are gaps, uh, be sure these people have been doing this for a long time, they'll find the gaps. Absolutely. And um, it's amazing how smart angel investors are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, people with money tend to normally would. Um, listen, um, Zev, this has been fantastic. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, all of Zev's information is going to be below this video so you can contact him. But uh, do, please do tell people, Zev, what it is you do today. Uh, I, before COVID, was a uh, international traveler, public uh, and speaker at many conferences that ended on March 1st of the first COVID year. And I, I switched uh, and pivoted into doing one-to-one -one consulting uh, with all sorts of startups. And frankly, they're all over the world. Um, it's very exciting for me, very rewarding. Uh, and I try to, you know, I give my time to the deserving and I charge my time to the under, to those who have enough wherewithal to pay for it. Um, I would really encourage anyone who's in a position to offer good advice to get in the habit of uh, helping people who need it. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely. I think we everybody has a, has a duty. I mean, you've, you've, when you've amassed experience and you have in everybody has skills and insights and experience that they can absolutely share with people. And I think that'll make the world a better place if people get more used to sharing. Absolutely, John. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, thanks again, Zev. My name is John Golden. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.